Hello and welcome to the Headache Doctor podcast. We're on this podcast, it's our mission to educate and empower everyone with headaches and migraines so that you can break free from a life of fear of your next headache or migraine and dependence on medication. In today's podcast, we have an exciting guest. This is Dr. Sui Wong. She's an award-winning neurologist, founder of the Brain Health Practice, uh, best-selling author and expert uh, in migraine health management. She has a focus on mindfulness, lifestyle changes, and holistic health approaches. And uh, her understanding and approach to migraine management is going to fit in very well with the content that we put out here on the Headache Doctor podcast. So Dr. Wong, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much, Dr. Taves. I'm so excited to be here and to speak with your listeners. All right, so let's start out with um, you telling us a little bit about your journey from, let's say, traditional neurology to now integrating lifestyle holistic approaches into your practice. So yeah, my my initial training is really traditional, as you uh, indicated. So I went through my training in the United Kingdom, and the way that we train, we start off, we start off being trained in internal medicine. So I'm a physician for adults in internal medicine. And then we delve into further training in neurology. And I love neurology. It's, um, the, it's, an, it's real art and science of it. And there's so many things that we can help people through the way that we pick up what's causing their problems and how we help them. And it was as I was um, working for a few years as a neurologist, I also started changing my own life from being super stressed, having to see so many patients, not really taking care of myself, you know, just relying on fast foods, <laughs> quick sugar heat hits and uh, caffeine, and not really sleeping so well, I started to have a transition. I had this opportunity where I started to do more movement and it started with yoga. And I then, of course, it, that continued down a whole path of body movement, um, body work, breath work, mindfulness and such things. But um, the, at the very beginning, it made me realize that when I slowed down and I looked after myself, and that also transitioned to how I choose what I eat, being conscious about how I live, the kind of things I'm eating, my sleeping times, and these lifestyle-based approaches. And I was feeling so much better. And I was better not just in my well-being, but also how I could function as a doctor, how I could provide a better service, and how I could uh, connect better with my patients and empathize with what they're going through. And um, and then I, of course, I also then convinced my family about the importance of uh, certain, of the lifestyle choices. And I I was thinking about why, if I feel so passionately about this being right for my health and having evidence for that and with my family, why am I not talking about it with my patients? And that's when I decided mm. to get certified in lifestyle medicine approaches. And I continue on with uh, really extensively with my yoga training, with a lot of body work uh, training, fascia, anatomy, um, and, and in, in those aspects. Initially, it was really quite separate. It was quite funny because I used to go teach yoga in the morning before I went into the hospital to do my doctor work. <laughs> and then okay. I'll go do my doctor work. But I didn't tell anybody at the, back at the very beginning because I didn't know whether it was okay that I was a yoga teacher and a doctor. So hmm. the, the yoga people didn't know I was a doctor or a neurologist even. But at, at, by the time I was a neurologist and my hospital uh, colleagues didn't know I was a yoga teacher. Uh, but okay. I realized when I started talking, I know, I, I thought that it, I probably should keep this separate. But as I started talking and living more authentically, sharing about the benefits of mindfulness and yoga, and then <clears throat> more people at work realized I was also a yoga teacher and they loved it. And some of them came to my yoga classes. I mentioned some of the, uh, to the yoga people about me being a doctor. So it starts to come together and I realized that for me to show, to get my more conventional colleagues to be on board, I really need to show evidence for things. So, which was partly yeah. why I did my certifications. And also, 
I uh, managed to do some research on lifestyle basis and the most recent one was so exciting to be able to do. I um, did further training in mindfulness <laughs> and as I was doing that to be a teacher, uh, to be able to bring it into my clinical practice, I uh, was so inspired that I thought I have to deliver a mindfulness uh, research to treat a specific neurological condition that's quite linked with migraine, but it's a different condition. Um, it's called visual snow syndrome for those who are interested and it causes a lot of vision dysfunction. And um, I had the opportunity to do that. It was really uh, research by passion because I couldn't really raise funding for it. I couldn't convince people about the hypothesis. But I managed yeah. to raise just like a, a few thousand to get a psychologist to work alongside me. And it was so exciting because we showed it worked. It changed the brain pathways people got better. And actually, it's with this approach of bringing through evidence into my clinical practice, being part of lifestyle medicine societies uh, to show the evidence basis for my approaches and my colleagues are coming on board. And it's the funniest thing because I remember when I first started talking about it with my patients, I didn't know whether it was all right to talk about it. And, and I, but of course, once I got certified and I then, when I have my residents with me, my fellows, and they are listening to my consultations as I share with my patient, I could then talk about the evidence basis for them to improve their sleep quality, for them to do physical activity, mm. for them, for their eating patterns and such things. And, uh, and I later realized that my fellows who have, my, some, some of them have migraines, many of them do. I, I soon realized okay. that the, the running joke was that at the end of their fellowship with me, their migraines got better because they followed the advice I gave my patients. So that was really quite oh, funny amazing. when I found out. <laughs> yeah, that's the all most, the evidence uh, they need. Yeah, <laughs> it was wonderful because I think sometimes when my conventional doctor colleagues are actually like open to this and on board with it. And, you know, of course we do it in an approach that is kind of based on evidence and we kind of think through things in a very methodical way. People are on board with it. And yeah, that's uh, my long answer to how I came into lifestyle and integrative approaches. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing because you, uh, you had the tricky task of taking what sounds like your own experience uh, leading you towards lifestyle changes, lifestyle medicine, and then, yeah, integrating that back in with your colleagues that are, you know, going to say, hey, where's the evidence? We need to see this. Yeah. And, and you were able to do that. I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. A couple of the things that you um, uh, you talk about are, are, are sort of your, uh, some of the pinnacles of what you're um, looking to change uh, let's maybe just start with defining terms. So what does it mean to build brain resilience? And then you, you also talk about balancing the autonomic nervous system. Can you define um, those two things, if possible, for our, our listeners? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, I realized that um, that was that really nicely summed up my approach. Um, I like to be systematic yeah. when I think of things. Yeah. And I realized that it came to two categories. So the, the lifestyle-based approach for uh, migraines, for example, so I, uh, I uh, summarize that to an acronym or initialism called BRAINS for building brain resilience for the first part and balancing the autonomic nervous system. So the building okay. brain resilience comes from my thought process of how do we support the brain so our brains are in optimum health. So that, you know, whenever we're ill, whenever we are get, you know, how do we prevent migraine attacks, reduce the threshold of getting migraine attacks? Um, and, uh, you know, how do we uh, protect our brains against uh, future problems from inflammation or cognitive decline and such things? So um, the, the key aspects to that include sleep, foundational aspects uh, of sleep, getting into a good pattern and high quality sleep, metabolic health, so balancing of blood sugar to reduce the swings of it and uh, dealing with things such as insulin resistance um, and pre-diabetes, for example, nutrition mm -hmm. and nutrients. So the nutrition part links in really nicely with metabolic health and the nutrients that we can get from food. And then the other aspect is gut health. 
gut health that really okay. is important for, with the gut brain axis and the kind of foods that we're eating how do we support our gut microbiome the the healthy bacteria in our gut to thrive more to produce the the chemicals the molecules that would be uh, anti-inflammatory that could support brain health connections the neurotransmitters the feel-good hormones the serotonin and such things there is mm -hmm. also physical activity you know uh, as of course you with your work you know the importance of it i right right i, I always people have to, to remind people this absolutely so important so good for the brain lots of um you know uh, brain derived neurotrophic factors lots of um Mm -hmm. chemicals and neurotransmitters that could be boosted with physical activity. So we talk about the different aspects. So from the slower, uh, what we call the base cardio or uh, moderate intensity, like brisk walking, to doing uh, strength, to doing mobility, you know, having the awareness right. with our joints and the movements and the mind-body connections. Um, and, and then um, there are other aspects as well, which includes, you know, mindset to come with all that. And the Balancing the autonomic nervous system is the way I think about um, the other side of how do we bring in mindfulness? Why is it actually important? What about yoga? What about breath work? Visualizations, mm. um, mind-body connection. And it, the way I think about it is that it benefits us in the way we think of the word stress. Some people say, oh, I'm really very stressed. And then after a really stressful period, you know, your, the people uh, who have migraines will probably experience that there is a come down after a stressful period. So after hitting right, a really right. hard deadline, working a really tough work week, the weekend comes, they get hit with a weekend migraine or they work really hard, get this well-earned vacation and the first day of vacation, migraine. Yeah, How unfair migraine. is that? Yeah. You know, it's the come down of stress. So I talk about things like it's not about stress being bad. It's our response to stress and our body really needs mm. to be able to have two parts of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system, as you'll know, is the, uh, is the nerve part of our nervous system that helps with the automatic functions of the body, such as sweating or heart rate or blood pressure, the pupil dilatation mm -hmm. and such things. So the automatic functions. And there are two parts of it. One part is what we call the sympathetic and the other the parasympathetic. Another lay, way, lay person uh, wording of using it, uh, describing it is the fight or flight response is in the sympathetic mm -hmm. or really is the kind of get up, up and go. It doesn't have to be fighting or fighting right. uh, or, uh, or, or it's not about necessarily to the extreme, but there is that aspect as well where one will have to um, kind of, you know, get up and go in the morning, for example, or get ready for a presentation, get ready for an exam. So that's required. And the other part, which, which would be the rest and relax part, you know, it's time to digest our food. It's time to sleep. And how do we have both of that in balance? So I think of it like a seesaw as well. Sometimes you need one in the morning, uh, one up and going and the other, the other time, uh, you know, the other. So it's really the balance of both. So yeah, so, so I use uh, methods such as the awareness of what the body's feeling, the interceptive aspect of noticing what's going on with the body's response, what is, what is helpful right now for example, and creating mindful moments throughout the day. Um, so yeah, so, so that's kind of my approach um, of uh, broadly speaking of the building brain resilience yeah. and balancing the autonomic nervous system. I love it. That's fantastic. The, the few things that stuck out to me that we have talked about on this podcast, uh, you mentioned the term threshold um, yes. and the the idea of overall health, and it looks like those categories there of sleep, metabolic health, nutrition, gut health. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about threshold and then in that, um, maybe highlight some of the problems you're seeing that, that need to be addressed in your own patients. Yes, thank you. So I used the word threshold to talk about how um, somebody gets a migraine attack. So another way I, uh, another analogy I use is that, well, firstly, just to define why migraine happens, it's a genetic, uh, it's a neurological condition due to a genetic tendency. 
uh, influenced by external factors. So it's, there is a sensory processing integration and people get headaches. Usually also there are lots of other non-headache symptoms, which is the kind of things I oftentimes see in my clinic. So it could be visual aspects. So uh, as you will know, I, I am a neurologist, but I also specialize in the visual aspect. Uh, in my day to day. So mm -hmm. I see a lot of patients who have visual disturbances uh, due to migraines, for example. But oftentimes there are other things that is harder to explain, like how the brain starts to slow down a little bit. You know, the words can't mm -hmm. quite think as clearly, not as crisp with the thinking, not as quick, getting the spelling wrong, brain fog type things, mood change mood being affected. And we know when people are, you know, um, good quality research shows that a high proportion of people with migraines have all these issues. And the problem is, right. it's a hidden disability, which is why I feel so strongly that like we really have to support people who have migraines. It's a hidden disability. And, um, you know, people suffer through it. They feel like they have to push through it. So to come back to the migraine threshold thing, I think of it as, um, you know, once you get to a certain point and then things uh, tip over to get migraine attacks. Um, so I use that example of a boiling pot. So mm -hmm. imagine you have a boiling pot of, uh, you have a pot with boiling water. And when the pot overboils, the water overflows, we have two options. We could either remove the lid from the pan if it was there, or we can mm -hmm. pour some cold water on top to settle down the pot from overboiling. So it's something like, um, right. you know, taking painkillers. Uh, you know, if the, the, the analogy of pouring cold water as pa taking painkillers, but it also it works. We can't keep pouring the cold water because then it will spill over again. Um, and one of the issues right. I see, sadly, when people don't realize it is that when they take a lot of painkillers, um, they are at risk of getting something called medication overuse headache, which is an ongoing uh, mm. cycle of more headaches, more migraines, um, which is understandable when people have pain because it's so difficult. And what they know from the, what they are told from uh, people or the advertisements is that painkillers are there to kill pain. So people do what they think is right, right but without the knowledge that it could cause a ongoing cycle and like higher likelihood of more and more migraines and headaches. So that's one aspect I oftentimes see. And um, so that's one. So then we go, what do we, how do we then prevent the pot from boiling over or the water from overflowing? Then it's about turning down the fire, turning down the right. source of it. Right which is dealing with external factors, which is how I then bring in the brain's approach of building brain resilience and balancing the autonomic nervous system. And oftentimes it starts with um, uh, asking the person in front of me what's, what's been working for them, what's not been working for them, what they think is the triggers. And then we, uh, we work on that and then we build the foundations to really settle everything, turning down the fire, clearing the decks and going through the systematically looking at their sleep, their, met, their blood sugar responses, um, and all the other things that I mentioned. And in fact, um, the most yeah. common things uh, I oftentimes see in my practice would be the modern phenomenon of sleep issues. It's so difficult for people to prioritize the sleep because there seems to be so many other competing, uh, it, uh, people competing for their time, whether it's their mobile phones, work emails, or, right. you know, or, or, or lots of things uh, to catch up on. And it never seems to end, of course. And then there's t timing of work shifts, early start during the weekdays, and then trying to catch up with sleep on weekends. So we talk about how we start to stabilize sleep patterns and how we, uh, you know, so to avoid the catching up of sleep, because I'm sure a lot of your uh, listeners with migraines will have experience where, you know, sleeping too much causes migraines. And actually it's the, the experience mm -hmm. of sleeping in on weekends, which is where this instability of the sleep pattern comes in. Of course, they feel the need to sleep in on weekends because they're exhausted. But that mm. shift from five hours of sleep to 10 hours of sleep, that big shift is um, oftentimes is a very common trigger for people with migraine. So that's one, we work on that. And then the other aspect, uh, big aspect I pick up is the swings of blood sugar. You know, we have uh, okay. people who find that, you know, after, uh, you know, one or two hours after eating a certain meal, 
they get the migraine coming on a fogginess comes and it yeah. may be the food right. that they tri- that starts triggering oftentimes though from my experience is the blood sugar stability so depending on what they're eating for example at lunch if in the uk oftentimes people uh, grab a sandwich um, uh, orange juice and potato potato chip potato chips it's called crisps okay. in the UK, but that's why my, I had a crisps, real yeah. tongue twisty moment there is potato chips. And so, so that of course has a <laughs> lot of carbohydrates that causes a sharp shoot of blood sugar. And then with that comes a crash. And with that crash, mm. the brain starts to feel it. So stabilizing that, changing the food choices to maybe a big bowl of leafy salad to begin with, a little bowl of soup, and then having the sandwich really stabilize that. Uh, blood sugar levels, for example, or for some people, they have an appropriately, uh, you know, a, a lunch that is helpful for their blood sugar levels, but it may be a very long gap. So they may have their lunch at 12 mm. and with their metabolism right. by about 4 p.m., they, they kind of feel like, oh, they need something or their energy levels are low or some a migraine is coming on. And then oftentimes then it's a grabbing of something sweet. And of course, the people will have experience where a little sugar hit really just helps push through. But then, then there's the crash after that. So there are some people I right. just going through what they do, we realize that they can have a well timed snack. So about, you know, a specific time that before they start to get that, they may have a palm full of nuts, so that it kind of has got the fiber, the protein, the healthy fats, and it stabilizes the blood sugar response to something else like berries or cherries or an apple. So a fruit that has carbohydrates, that's nice, steady release or something else like chickpeas. Um, I have recently started to roast chickpeas for snacks and uh, it's a there big hit for the people I offer. It's a big hit. So, <laughs> so okay. you've got a protein with it, Sounds the yummy. fiber. Yeah, absolutely. So it's about thinking through um, through these lens um, of, you know, what are the foundational aspects to help the brain and, um, you know, the resilience aspect. And then other things like, you know, stresses. Is it, you know, how are people finding their lives day to day and bringing in breath work? So I've got some um, mm. little strategies that I share. So I said about avoiding painkillers. And then the next question is, what do I do? I've got a pain coming. So, so we have little, I have yeah, little strategies right. that I share, such as some people like something physical, either heat or cold. So, you know, uh, that's already probably well tried for many people. And then I do things to like stimulate the vagus nerve, whether it's some tapping okay. uh, on the collar, uh, on the chest, or, um, you know, the, the, the bones around the face and um, the chest, or some humming, or uh, mm. bringing in some breath work. So there is this breath uh, practice I share where you do an extended exhale. So it's something like this. Okay. Let's say um, I first get somebody to settle, uh, you know, into their chair or wherever they are and just notice how their breathing pattern is. So without controlling it. So once they're aware of the breathing pattern and then they start to breathe in the same amount of time and then they hold for the same amount of time. So let's say if they, they count four counts to breathe in, then they hold for four counts and then they breathe out for double the in breath if they can. So breathing out for eight counts and then they hold again okay. for four counts. And there are lots of variations to this, like breathe in for four, hold for four, out for four, hold for four, or, you know, there are, there are variations that I share. I actually wrote a, a little book about the breath work in my mindfulness book. And in that, I kind of expand a little bit more about it. But it's the concept that exhale, when it's longer than inhale, can activate the rest and relax, the parasympathetic part of the nervous system. Because oftentimes at the very start of migraines, the body's going danger, danger. Mm, There's right. a lot of pain. <clears throat> so the sympathetic is on overdrive going oh and it's understandable and then it's migraine so the person experienced that so using these techniques the breath work and settling the mindfulness techniques and it just really helps to uh, to to break that cycle uh, so that's these are some of the tips that can be helpful not easy though i i appreciate the difficulty but it's one of those things right. that could be helpful this is this is incredible I, 
um, you, you've laid out so many things that our listeners can uh, take action on and um, very practical. We the So the last podcast I recorded, we talked a lot about breathing and mm. box breathing and the, the four second Amazing. holds. And um, so, yeah, it, it's... Uh, yeah, it's it's a recurring topic and and something that um, is uh, is so crucial to, uh, to to health and then balancing this autonomic nervous system. So, um, one thing that I'm curious about is uh, so one of the barriers that uh, I mean I know you're in the UK, but I think the healthcare uh, as far as like time with a patient, um, I, I would imagine it looks similar. One of the barriers providers have is they just don't have enough time to go through all these things with mm. people. And so I'm wondering how you've worked that into your practice. And, and then also, how do you balance um, this? Uh, the, so the medication approach with uh, your lifestyle approach? Yeah, it's a, it's a big topic, of course, and it depends on who walks through the door. Because I always think of my first job is to be of service to the person in front of me. And my service could be understand for them to understand what they're suffering, you know, what's, why they're having the pain, why they're having these strange symptoms. So, you know, that is right. part of, that could be uh, the key part of my service that the person who is in front of me wants from me. Or it could be that they want something more. You know, I have people who have come who come in who have tried painkillers and it's not working and they keep taking painkillers every day, it's not working and of course then they get the medication overuse. Or they go, oh, I think right. it's my, my, I think it's my, my jaw. I think I've got TMJ problems. They go to the dentist or they go, oh, I think I've got a neck problem. You know, I've got neck pain. And of course, then there's, it, there is so many difficulties um, that people are suffering from. And we try to tease it apart. And, um, right. and, and oftentimes start off with uh, sharing that what why they have migraines in the first place. So what I've just said about the neurological uh condition with genetic tendency influenced by external factors and I always remind people as part of empowering them is that although you can't change your genes you can change these external factors and that could right. be a big thing for people to take away with and I I want to avoid overwhelming with too much information sometimes it's the, it's yeah. the first step in them understanding and I share the the, the concept about what we have shared and then if they want to understand more i may just write on some bullet points actually i used to write bullet points and i realized that it takes me so long to write so, so sometimes i then <laughs> signpost them to other resources um and um, oh, okay. actually that is the motivation why i wrote the book break free from migraines naturally because i realized that there's so much information to share although of course i i don't yeah talk about my book in my National Health Service Clinic because I'm not sure whether that was all, that's yeah. all right to share my book, but my other colleagues share about it, uh, which is wonderful to hear. Um, but I just signpost them to the charity websites. There are lots of good charities, migraine charities, and they really advocate for people who have migraines. There are lots of good resources on those websites. And um, I talk broadly about the, the key principles and they'll go off to research it further uh, yeah, so th that's the initial approach, uh, generally speaking. That's great. Uh, and then I want you to to provide the listener with more information. I, I know you've got a few books and uh, any other resource or way that they can connect with you um, to, to, yeah, utilize the information that you have to improve their own situation. Oh, thank you so much. Specifically for the migraine aspect, I've got a book uh, called Break Free from Migraines Naturally. And it's on Amazon and also other bookstores um, online. But Amazon is the main place, Break Free from Migraines Naturally. It's on audiobook, ebook, um, paperback. And so that kind of outlines the lifestyle aspects. And I have a book called Mindfulness for Brain Health. And this is like my quite very special because of how you know, it was my first book. <laughs> and so, and so <laughs> how I started to bring this into my uh, research setting. Um, and it's actually about day-to-day um, -day practices for people to get mindful moments throughout the day. It's not about, oh, I you know, to sit and meditate for 20 minutes. It's not quite that. It's more, how do sure. we create little mindful moments 
to settle for self-care and there is there are um, uh, practices there where people can take on and think of it as doing a year of mindfulness practice for example where I have there are 14 chapters here, but 12 of those, I have a list of things that people can tap into so that they have, you know, they can think of it like a mindful year. So, so that's the mindfulness. And there is a book called Sleep Better to Thrive. It's to do with the, the challenges that I see where I help people to go through improving their sleep quality. So it's a workbook style, a short book where people can go through step by step how to improve their sleep quality and um, the the, and there is also one about um, ultra processed foods. I talked about the impact of gut mm. health the, and gut brain health. Right. And I and I, from my experience, as I shared at the very beginning, I was kind of using a lot of fast food, craving <laughs> craving for all the diet colas and such yeah. things. And I realized that actually it's not that because I'm weak, because that's what a lot of people think. Oh, I'm craving for this thing because I'm weak. Actually, there's more to that. It's the way food is made, mm. how it's composed and how it creates high people to eat more of it and crave more of it. So yeah, the, right. the quit ultra processed foods now is a six week thing where people go step by step to, uh, to get uh, to, to transition to more whole food style. It's not that to never have ultra processed food is to give them the power of choice. So that's the ultra processed food right. now. And I'm so excited that the, my, my upcoming book is coming out in November. So I'm not sure when your podcast will be launched, but it's in November. It's called Sweet Spot for okay. Brain Health. So it kind of goes on Sweet with spot this for whole brain thing health. about, okay. yeah, yeah, amazing. It's all about the balancing of the blood sugar and it goes into brain energy levels, stable brain energy, and it's all very practical. My books are basically like how I, my, my, my clinical practice is, which is practical. <laughs> what can we do now? <laughs> what is helpful? So it's yeah. practical. Man, you, um, thank you so much for your work. It sounds like you've just uh, poured into this and uh, have generously produced yeah, multiple books and uh, yeah, even coming on this podcast. I, I appreciate your passion and your desire to help people. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so, so grateful and honored to be here uh, to be on your podcast. And thank you for your generous words about the books. Um, I actually wrote it as, exactly as uh, what you indicated. I thought, huh, I'm having all these conversations with people in my clinic. And they're making, they're having like these incredible improvements. And I get asked, oh, why am I not talking more about it? And I, when I got asked that question, I thought, that's a really good question. Why am I not talking more about it? Hence the books and yeah. hence why I'm here. <laughs> Thanks so much for the invitation. I'm so grateful. <laughs> oh, can I share one more yeah, thing? It's if big... it's okay. Um, Go for it. Go um, for it. Uh, thank you. I, um, you said about how your, read, your listeners can connect. Um, I do have a newsletter. Every Thursday, it's okay. called Thursday Tips, where I write a short newsletter for bite-sized brain health tips to thrive. So it's a one-minute read where I share three tips and I leave the reader with one question. It's my Thursday Tips. Okay. So people can sign up to it uh, through my website. And my website is drswiwongmd.com, D-R-S-U-I-W-O-N-G-M-D.com. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, again, thank you, Dr. Wong. Um, and to all the listeners out there, it is, uh, a, a, yeah, an extra special thank you to you guys as you keep this podcast going. Uh, if you have connections and uh, providers or influences in your life, in the listener's life, and uh, voices that you want to hear on this podcast, please send them my way. Uh, as always on this podcast, we'll continue on this journey to help educate and empower everyone with headaches and migraines so that you can break free from a life of fear of your next headache or migraine and dependence on medication. We'll see you next time. 